Hello everyone, welcome to GGN. Today is Wednesday, October 24th, 2012. I'm Darko. I'm going to talk about the Middle East and cover those issues. Um, and then in the second or possibly third video, I'll get into the economy and a little bit of um, eugenics. The first article I have for you is The Engineered Fall of Syria. Extensive intelligence and paramilitary network exposed. Of course, this isn't the first time that uh, I've covered this before. I covered it from a land destroyer report, uh, basically covering the Brookings Institute report and policy on Syria and the regime change. I actually called it the regime change. So this is uh, very well known uh, to many people. But it says, this is from the editor. I've never been interested in being a cheerleader for any side, but merely objectively viewing. It says, reading this article in full, there is a machine at work in Syria, an immense war machine backed up with various intelligence agencies of the West, the smartest war strategists and logistical minds in the world. His question is, why is it taking so long for them to bring down Syria? I've actually wondered the same thing after covering it for months now. A nation the size of North Dakota shouldn't be much trouble for the U.S. Has Russia, China, and Iran outflank the global police of the world? Have they provided Assad with the necessary intel and ground-to-air military weaponry? Is that why the U.S. is so hesitant to make real overt moves instead of prodding Turkey to take the fall, which I've also mentioned as well? The U.S., Europe, and Arab nations are deeply invested in this conflict. And then they ask the question, will the gloves be taken off after the election, or will they continue their proxy war until the last of Assad's inner circle jump ship? That's exactly what they're trying to do as far as the Brookings Institute policy. That's the one that they're following. Um, create instability around the region, um, refugee crisis, put pressure on Assad uh, through defections. Uh, they're having a hard time doing that right now. And uh, keep a fresh supply of weapons in the hands of the rebels and the mercenaries and the travelers. Um, and Turkey's, of course, taking care of that. So it says at this stage of the battle for Syria, there's a specific role for foreign intelligence agencies, which in the summer of this year expanded its operations in the country. American, British, Turkish, French, Qatari, Saudi secret services are active on the weakening of the regime of Assad. Their sur uh, subversive work is multifaceted. Until recently, Western intelligence agencies have shown themselves very carefully. This was explained by fears of the U.S. and its European allies who strengthen the Islamic component of the Syrian opposition, which they've been doing. Of course, they go in there and talk about what I'm talking about, uh, basically ensuring the supply chain and finance arms opponents. This is straight out of the Brookings Institute a report, like I said before. I'm going to keep moving now because I've spent a lot of time on that issue. If, uh, if you haven't heard or read about it, go in there and check it out. U.N. may deploy troops during Syria ceasefire. This is from the 22nd. Then I saw this article here. Um, Syria agrees to ceasefire, so they agree to the ceasefire, and they're saying that with just three days left, uh, it isn't clear if the proposed Syria ceasefire will happen or not. If it does, however, UN officials say they are considering deploying troops to the nation to try to keep it going. And most of you are aware, the last time the United Nations was in Syria, uh, they were actually they had to leave because it was so uh, it was so dangerous there. Uh, that's when the journalist uh, Colvin uh, got shot and killed by the uh, by the rebels. Uh, also, the rebels were just wreaking havoc, and actually the United Nations observer, observers had to um, seek protection from the Syrian, big bad Syrian regime government uh, from these rebels. So, uh, moving on here, we have U.S. State Department demands Lebanon form a new government. So, just like um, Syria, where France was telling the rebels and the terrorists to go ahead and form your own government and we'll acknowledge it. And then, of course, recently uh, after that, they moved the rebels and Free Syrian Army and the transitional government for the regime change uh, was based in Turkey, and then they all of a sudden moved it into Syria. So with Lebanon's current government in turmoil after the weekend violence, the U.S. is taking the opportunity to once again insinuate itself directly into the political situation with the State Department while they're demanding that the president uh, form a new government with the Sunni-dominated opposition parties at the lead. So it says this is the reason for it, uh, justification, the export of instability from Syria. Well, that was imported, <laughs> yeah, that was imported into Syria, right? So they're talking about importing and exporting uh, terrorism and stuff like that so that they, they can do what they want to do. But we all know what it's all about, right? So regime change and a domino effect. We'll get to that here uh, shortly. U.S. interference in Lebanon escalates tension, says analyst. Goes down and says at this part, at this point, I confirm... Uh, the issue of stability of the country 
Any interference by any major power in the region will actually escalate the tension and would, and would not bring uh, peace, basically, and stability to Lebanon. So this Camille Wazni uh, is a political commentator. He says that they have an election eight months from today, and he thinks that if it, anybody's unhappy with the government in Lebanon, they should wait and wait for a democratic transition where people can go to the ballot and elect a new representative. So no one's taking responsibility for the bombing in Lebanon, um, but analysts are saying that Israel is behind the Lebanese uh, bombing. Uh, some of the reasons is because of this general that was assassinated, uh, dismantled an Israeli spy cell, among other things. Um, but the biggest, the biggest thing to look at is, is Syria. The, the, the global powers are not, or the Western faction is not, uh, they're not getting the regime change in Syria as, as fast as they would like. So then they start to do other things where they create instability around the region. Um, you know, if you can't get, if you can't get what you want, you don't have to uh, uh, change something directly or interfere with it directly. You just have to manipulate and change the environment around it, and then you'll get your change. So that's what they're doing at Lebanon. Oh, okay, we'll just do that. So they tried with the Turkish jet. Uh, they tried with uh, the the Turkish shelling, and people kind of caught on that that was a false flag. That was a, not really a false flag, but that was actually the rebels, the same uh, rebels that the Western uh, powers that are funding the Free Syrian Army. Those are, the, those are the ones that are actually responsible for that shelling that killed the Turkish people. Which led to, of course, all of the um, uh, uh, actions on the behalf of the Turkish government. They did, said, oh, we can go into your border now. We have we just passed the bill that we can, our military can go across into the Syrian border. Uh, also, they've been grounding jets, skyjacking them, uh, putting tanks and troops on the border. So this is just another thing. It, it, it's it's a really, uh, uh, I mean, it's not just Zionists. It's it's just a good old-fashioned tactics that's used by the Anglo-Zionist um, Sunni faction, which is false flag, and that's what happened in, uh, in in Lebanon right now. So that now they can go on the attack. U.S. destabilizes Lebanon to break anti-West resistance. So it goes on and it says, by all means, the government in Lebanon is a true representative of its people. It is an elected government, so I don't know how the U.S. government would do this kind of a legal act in the open, said uh, um, a professor, a doctor, president of the Society for International Reforms and Research, and they're talking about what? They're talking about uh, the U.S. telling them to change their government. He noted that the U.S. benefits from instability in Lebanon as Washington looks to expand its presence in the region. So the U.S., with its allies like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, and so on, they are there to support the policies. They're in support of monarchies and support of dictatorial regimes. And that's how you know this whole thing's a farce. I mean, even if it's not about big conspiracy theory, it's about what? The, 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 the governments that are supporting this, especially the Gulf monarchies, they're dictatorships. Why in the holy hell would they care about democracy? Well, it has to do with uh, sectarian lines. It has to do with controlling resources. It's all business. So General Wesley Clark reveals U.S. plan to invade Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. So we all know about this. You can go in and check it out if you haven't seen it. But uh, yeah, he revealed this. This was 10 days after 9-11. So, and one of those is what? Lebanon. They've just gotten pretty much Somalia down on its feet. Uh, Libya, they've taken that out. They've taken out Afghanistan. They've taken out Iraq. Uh, they're trying with Syria. They're also trying with Sudan, stepping that up as well. So this is definitely, you know, by plan. This isn't just a happenstance. The danger now is that Lebanon state always uh, tenuously negotiated compromise falls apart under this strain. So that's exactly what they would want, right? Just like they don't want Syria doing its own reforms independently as a sovereign nation, uh, bringing about these social reforms that these protests were initially uh, about. They don't want that to happen. That's like in, what, 2013, 2014? Uh, they want to get it done before that. Hezbollah prepares for a wider war than it may want. Hezbollah is launching a pilot spy plane, which was shot down by Israel's Air Force in a southern country in October, has been seen as more evidence that the Lebanese militia is preparing for war. So this is from Bloomberg, so take it uh, for what it is. Then Syria spillover, Lebanon army deploys in Beirut and Tripoli. The Lebanese army is deployed on the streets of Beirut and Tripoli in a bid to calm deadly tensions, which was, again, all engineered. Moving on, nine Israeli planes violate Lebanese airspace. Usually it's just one, but this is actually nine. Reconnaissance planes, spy planes, violated Lebanese airspace in separate times and flew over various areas. So, you know, just for whatever it's worth, isn't it kind of interesting? 
I mean, Lebanon could be shooting down these Zionist drones every day because they fly over and violate their airspace every single day. They could just shoot it down and they would be justified in doing so. But why is it uh, when a Lebanese uh, plane or drone goes over there, over Israel's airspace, they shot down and of course, you know, Israel being Israel, they've been attacked, they're on the defense, everybody's out to get them. A poll says majority of Israeli Jews would support apartheid regimes in Israel. About a third of the Jewish public and 70% of the Orthodox community would support barring Israeli Arabs from voting. So, pretty interesting. It says a majority explicitly favors systematic discrimination against the Israeli Arabs. New survey conducted by Israeli data. Uh, you can go over there and check it out. 59% said they want preference for Jews over Arabs. Uh, want the state to treat Jewish citizens better than Arabs. So, uh, goes on and on. Anyways, Israel settlements, not Yahoo, vows to continue housing construction, so Israeli expansion continues. And Israel says 79 rockets fired at it from Gaza. Not a very good headline, not a very good photo for what they're talking about. Palestinians fired dozens of rockets into Israel from Gaza on Wednesday, and uh, Israeli airstrike killed a militant a day after the Emir of Qatar made a rare visit to the enclaves of Hamas leadership. So Qataris, what, or Qatar, they're the ones that are with the Gulf states, uh, trying to push that regime change in Syria, so a lot of uh, disinfo, right? So they said Hamas claimed responsibility for some of the rocket and mortar bomb attacks, prompting Israelis to wonder whether it had been emboldened by the Qatari visit on Tuesday. So yeah, I've, I've heard the uh, the theory or the proposition that, uh, you know, Israel created Hamas so that they can control them, controlled opposition. Okay, so this is the thing. This is covering what news? Israeli airstrike on Gaza injures two Palestinian women. So they've been injured in an airstrike conducted by Israeli air fighter jets. Earlier in the day, another Palestinian died succumbing to his injuries sustained in recent airstrikes carried out. Also, the victim was the fourth Palestinian killed in these airstrikes on the coastal enclave since Tuesday night. U.S. drones kill up to three in Pakistan. They say it's not clear whether they had any link to militancy. Pakistani officials gave conflicting accounts of how many were killed or whether they were men or women, or whether they had any link to militancy, according to the AP. It doesn't really matter. And just like I said yesterday in yesterday's news reports is what? Is that they are experimenting. Like the whole drone strikes in the Middle East and that, and um, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, it's uh, they're experimenting. They're seeing what works and what doesn't work, and eventually they will take that home to the, quote, homeland and use it against their own citizens. So as far as militants, if you just picture, you know, uh, Middle Eastern people with turbans and beards and stuff like that, think again. That's why I always mention every once in a while about getting drone bombed in your backyard, and now they have these directed energy lasers that they're just telling the sheeple about. They've, you know, they have it. They have the technology available. It's just a matter of mass producing them. Uh, and getting a laser striked in your backyard, you know? says, uh, but this is the thing, militants. To avoid counting civilian deaths, Obama redefined militant to mean all military age mil males in a strike zone. All military age males in a strike zone are militants. So, and of course, it has nothing to do with Obama. It has to do with the intelligence and defense community. U.S. outspends Islamabad on flood relief in Pakistan. So here we go again, right, with the vaccines and that. But instead of helping repair U.S.-Pakistani relations because of all the drone strikes, the flood aid looks as if it is feeding into old patterns of distrust between the two countries. Old patterns, as if they're not already pissed off at Americans. And it's really sad because, they're I mean, what, what they're doing is they're literally paying them off, contributing substantial funds despite strained ties. Well, just like the drones... That's why I said they're not going to stop because the Pakistani government is taking billions of dollars uh, for these drone strikes, which, you know, are leading to collateral damage, killing women and children, to take out a militant group that was actually created by the West. So, I mean, there's the irony. The other thing, too, is what? They're going to come in with vaccines. A polio, why the Taliban hates polio vaccines. A polio vaccinator was gunned down in Pakistan's Blucha stands Provost Tuesday, highlighting tensions between local health officials pushed to stem the region's polio epidemic, i.e. Uh, carry out eugenics on those poor people, and attempts by the Pakistani Taliban commanders to ban vaccinations. A team of male and female vaccinators was administrating polio drops to children's door-to-door -door when unknown gunmen on a motorbike shot dead a male volunteer. So they said the Taliban's fears also stemmed from the Pakistani doctor-administered polio vaccines have been working for the CIA and help 
Alice Bin Laden. So it has nothing to do with that. What were they doing? They were extracting DNA in that too. When you give the problem that all the children are going to die if they don't get their vaccine. Well, why do eugenicists that rabble rabble about too many people care about saving people? There you go. Thank you.